Hi, my name is Kristen Deedy, and I have the privilege of serving as the Glass Education Administrator here at Salem Community College. I also have the honor of hosting this event this evening and would like to extend a big thank you to our participants and to all of you for joining us for this conversation. Before I introduce you to our special guests, I would like to share with you a quick overview of our facility and what we do here. Salem's Glass Center is home to two very exciting and well-known glass-focused degree programs. The college's one-of-a-kind scientific glass technology program prepares students to fabricate scientific glass apparatus for research and for industry. The glass art program prepares students for working with glass creatively and for transfer to four-year fine art programs. The center also hosts numerous extracurricular glass workshops and events throughout the year, including the International Flameworking Conference. The 20,000 square foot center houses four studio areas for working with glass, including flame working, glass blowing, cold working, and kiln working, as well as a fabrication area, a shared studio space, classrooms, and a gallery. The college is home to the Paul and Patricia Stankard Glass Collection. This incredible collection of contemporary glass with a focus on flame worked glass is a point of interest and an inspiration to our students and our visitors. The SCC Glass Center provides an excellent space for those dedicated to working with this material to fully immerse themselves and to explore all the possibilities in working with glass under one roof. The opportunities in exploring the material here are endless. If you would like to learn more about our programs, our facility, and our wonderful community here at the Glass Center, I encourage you to visit our website and to check us out on social media. I'd now like to introduce you to all of our special guests this evening. A pioneer in the studio glass movement, Paul Stankard's work is represented in over 80 museums around the world. Stankard is the recipient of numerous awards and honorary doctorate degrees. He recently received a Lifetime Achievement Award from the Glass Art Society. He is an artist and resident and honorary professor at Salem Community College. Stankard has authored three books, an autobiography in 2007 titled No Green Berries or Leaves, an educational resource in 2014 titled Spark the Creative Flame, and most recently, Studio Craft is Career, a guide to achieving excellence in art making. Amber Cowan's sculptural glass work is based around the use of recycled, upcycled, and second life American pressed glass. She uses the processes of flame working, hot sculpting, and glass blowing to create sculptures that overwhelm the viewer with ornate abstraction and viral cruel. Her pieces reference memory, domesticity, and the loss of an industry through the reuse of common items from the aesthetic dustbin of American design. Cowan lives in Philadelphia where, she, where she received an MFA in ceramics and glass from the Tyler School of Art and Architecture of Temple University. She has been a faculty member of this glass department since 2010. Shane Farrow was born in Chicago, Illinois in 1953 and has been a flame worker for over 50 years and maintains a studio next to the Penland School in North Carolina. He participates in international symposia and conferences. Farrow is also an educator and has taught, lectured, or demonstrated at institutions across the US, Japan, Italy, the Netherlands, Taiwan, Ger China, Germany, Australia, the UK, and Turkey. His work can be found in collections both private and in public institutions worldwide. He received a Lifetime Membership Award from GAS in 2014 and was the featured artist at the IFC in 2009. Sarah Sally Legrand, award-winning artist and author, has, the great has had the great fortune to study with many gifted teachers, both in America and in Italy. She holds a BA in glass formation from Park University in Parkville, Missouri. She has taught flame working all over the world. Her work has been published in many books and magazines, including The Flow, Beat and Button, and Glass Art Magazine. Her work can be found in public and private collections around the world. Amy Lemaire is a multidisciplinary artist and educator based in Brooklyn, New York. An explorer at heart, her work reveals an interest in currency systems, material language poetics, and the production of histories. Lemaire studied at the School of the, of the Art Institute of Chicago and Pratt Institute. She currently teaches at Salem Community College. Recent residencies include Urban Glass, Brooklyn Navy Yard, Wheaton Arts, the Museum of Art and Design, and Tyler School of Art. Lemaire lectures and writes about topics related to flame working. Her, re her research has been presented at the International Flame Working Conference and in Glass Quarterly Magazine. 
Carmen Lozar is a glass artist and faculty member of the Ames School of Art in Illinois Wesleyan University in Bloomington, Illinois. She often travels abroad to teach and share her love for glass, most recently to England, Turkey, Italy, and New Zealand, but always returns to her Midwestern roots. Carmen's love of storytelling leads to works of art that are sometimes sad, funny, or thoughtful, but are always about engaging with life. David Willis grew up outside of New York City and earned a BA in interdepartmental, interdepartmental field studies from UC Berkeley with an emphasis on social change and a minor in conservation and resource studies. David began working with glass in 1994. Drawing heavily from nature and taking a cross-disciplinary approach to the material, his work focuses around the idea that the most intimate aspects of an individual's life are common to all people. David's work is included in public, private, and museum collections nationally and internationally. Before we get started, I just wanna say, um, we have everybody on mute currently. Uh, that's not a panelist or, or Paul. Um, but we are interested in having the audience engage with questions as well. Uh, the best thing you can do if you have questions throughout uh, the event here is to send me a message in the chat. Um, let me know if you'd like me to ask a question on your behalf or if we have time, if you'd like to be unmuted and, and ask a question. Is that good? All right, I'll let Paul take it from here. Thank you, Kristen. And uh, this is a privilege for me to be uh, involved in this Zoom with such talented people. I'm, uh, it's a little scary actually. But I thought we would start with the opening theme. Uh, flame working goes, flame work, flame working glass goes to art schools. And I thought I would uh, solicit a comment, uh, short comments from each of the, uh, the uh, panelists, and then we can open it up about our school versus uh, self-directed learning. So why don't we start with uh, uh, Sarah Sally uh, Legrand. Okay, well, you know that I, art school was very important to me. Um, I think it's really important for you to look at everything in a historical context and uh, look at the clues that artists over history have uh, used to communicate, you know, the human condition and how that really changed my work from really production work to um, things with more narrative and more soul, if you will. So yeah, it was really important to me. Um, that's how I feel about it. That's at my one minute. Can I stop right there? <laughs> great, great. Okay, Amy. Uh, well, I think that art school, uh, there's a huge benefit to going to formal art school. And um, I think the, the biggest takeaway for me was um, becoming fluent in visual language in my work um, and understanding, uh, having kind of an idea of how my viewers are going to, um, are going to decipher my work. So um, that was, I think, probably the biggest thing that I learned among many, many other important lessons. Great. Common. Uh, yeah, I think uh, being an undergraduate and being exposed to the connections. Uh, we talked a little bit about this the other day, but they're having the connections, the people you meet. I would have never had a uh, internship at Bullseye if I didn't have, uh, you know, Bill Carlson calling him up and trying to get that for me. And I would have never had my first show at um, Ken Saunders had the university not taken me there as a student and introduced me to those people. So I think it's a it's a matter of community. It's a huge it's a huge wonderful community, as well. Very good, Shane. Well, I'm one of the few here, including you and you and David Paul, that didn't go to art school really. Um, you know, I guess when I had been doing glass for about a few years, I don't know, about five or six years when I decided uh, talking with some friends that I wanted to uh, expand, you know, making what flame work glass was in the United States and what I knew of what was in the rest of the world into being something where you would include narrative or different topics uh, into what you actually made. And so that was the direction I took. And, and to go in that direction, you had to do a lot of research. You know, I wasn't really influenced uh, 
in my university, uh, because I wasn't associated with the art department, I was in the philosophy department. However, the philosophy uh, staff uh, actually uh, in, interacted with me as an artist. So they wanted to know my view of things like in terms of aesthetics and things like that. So really, I'm really more self-educated than uh, going to an art school, although I've done lots of uh, residencies at universities. Great, great. Thank you. Amber, you're up. Hello. Um, I would say for, for me, um, you know, going back and getting my master's degree really was a turning point in my life. Um, and obviously that's a very personal decision um, to take on this kind of debt and decision to change your life um, for those few years. But, you know, I was bartending full time. I was um, kind of floundering with my work and it gave me the... Um, focus and drive for those two years to really like see that this is what I was wanted to do. Um, I was about to completely change my uh, career at that point. So it really like redirected me um, into the, the path that I am on now. So beautiful, sir. Uh, Lily, you're up, Lily. <laughs> I'm just going to speak for Lily. Okay. The dogs won't get involved. I think um, any education, any study that you're interested in is always going to be worthwhile. Um, I've continually contemplated uh, pursuing a degree because, you know, I have my bachelor's in kind of social sciences areas. Um, and I think if I went back for an MFA now, I'd probably look into like a art and social practice degree. But I, I think it, I think it could be super valuable. And the thing that like I've been noticing most often is I have a friend who's at a Kent state and he posts a lot on Instagram to have an e-banks. And I'm, I'm always, I've been in the past couple weeks looking at the facilities that he has access to between the large kilns, the hot shop, you know, the, you know, just kind of the infrastructure to support his work, no matter what he wants to do. I'm jealous of that. Um, so I think even just to, you know, as an artist with a kind of established studio practice, I don't really think so much about going back to school for glass, unless I look at that and then I'm going like, wow, wouldn't that be fantastic to have all of those things at my disposal and just the time to investigate. So I think it's super valuable. Does he have the same working facility that. at the Kent State? I don't know. I probably I haven't seen any pictures of it in no. his in his Instagram stories. No. I haven't asked him either. Or maybe I asked him, but I don't remember. Or you know, it was one of those things of like, yeah, we have it. It's a torch in a closet. Yeah. So I'm sure we'll get that later. One of the conversations I had with Amber about uh, the benefit, one of the big benefits of art schools in community and an informed opinion is critique, for having your work critiqued. Amber, do you want to pick up on that value of uh, having your work critiqued? Um, yeah, I think, you know, I think about this a lot actually, and with talk about this with my classes is that, um, you know, having, having formal critique and and it, and also having the deadlines of critique is such a benefit. Um, you know, once you get outside of the school setting, I find that it's hard to even get a friend to come over to say it looks cool. You know, it's like <laughs> this puts you on it. It puts you on a deadline. It gives you the competition of your peers, which I think is important. And you know, maybe that could be reactivated in some other way outside um, of a former formal art school setting but I think that that for me was a definitely a real benefit and I see that as a benefit yeah, of the formal program. I have the good fortune of um, living uh, living near Wheaton Arts in Millville, New Jersey where we have the international framework oh, excuse me where we have the uh, Creative Glass Center where artists come from around the world. And I've always enjoyed in being involved in critiquing 
asking them to critique my work and, and, and in return critiquing your work. And it's really, uh, at times, uh, they'll give you a clue that will set you in motion for quite a while. Does anybody, uh, panel, does anybody else want to chime in on that? Uh, I would that? agree. I've, I've just noticed, you know, having been online and teaching and now being back in the classroom and having critiques again, um, to see my students, I realize that it's so important for them to see each other's work. They are learning more by just looking, walking around a room and looking at each other's work than anything I could say during that critique. The visual information they're getting, as Amber even said, the competition, the, um, oh, look at, they tried that and I didn't, they took a risk, I didn't, or maybe I should have done, you know, tried this technique or thought a little bit, you know, farther outside the box. That's, that's invaluable. It's just invaluable. Is one of the one of the merits of uh, an art program, especially in glass, originality? Do do the educators promote uh, uh, work, making work personal, and kind of guide the students towards uh, being a originality? What do you think, Carmen? Do you encourage originality? I do, but this is one of the things I thought. I think it's very difficult not to teach what you love, right? And I love, there's certain things I love and yeah. uh, I love making. And so some of the artists I even show my students uh, reflects my loves, right? Of a certain aesthetic. And then you yeah. kind of, I think they see that and um, sometimes they might follow that direction. I think it's difficult to teach outside yourself, but I think it's very important to show a wide range. And I think that's something that probably Amy could answer to as well. Amy, yeah. uh, your, your work is, uh, I don't know, for me, from my perspective, it looks experimental and very, very uh, uh, fresh and mm. ambitious. And I'm thinking, oh my God, that might be the future. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, we're at an interesting moment now um, where there, we're having kind of a technological moment. And so uh, that that shifts things for sculpture, you know? And so, um, uh, yeah, so I think about that a lot in my, in my work and analog, like I'm, I'm from a split generation who grew up uh, kind of in the analog, uh, in the analog world and then shifted to digital. And so a lot of my work is about that. And that's, those are issues that we address in, in school a lot, actually, when I'm teaching um, in flame working it is about um, how the students are approaching the craft of flame working and using these new new, te new technologies to um, to continue to make their work original in in the twenty first century. Well, I know that uh, some of your some of the work is uh, uh, I don't even know the vocabulary for it. So new uh, neon. It's you're in integrating neon yes. gases or gases to illuminate the sculpture, which is fascinating. Yeah, I've been work. I'm teaching plasma design currently um, over at Salem Community College, and we're learning about um, vacuum systems, how to build vacuum systems, and use them uh, in in a functional way um, to make art, and then also uh, practical applications of scientific glass technologies. But there's a there's a lot that can be learned from just using these technologies to experiment with and try to find try to find new vocabulary for our personal visual languages. So that's, that's sort of like the main event for the class is to try yeah. to um, establish new, uh, almost like a new way of making marks through light. Yeah, well, when I, uh, I've been following David Willis's career for uh, 10 years or better. <laughs> and I, he makes me feel like I'm a peewee. Because <laughs> he's doing, he does, he makes major, major installations and then he'll make a beautiful little flower. And I'm looking at that flower. And the only, the only thing is, I hope he doesn't want to encapsulate it in glass. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's been done. <laughs> David, <laughs> you really explore a lot of, I remember you saying once that uh, you're fascinated with glass, but you're not committed to a process. Well, I think, uh... You know, glass is such an interesting material. And I think among art materials, it's probably the least explored yeah. because people as individuals just haven't had the opportunity to, you know, work with it in their home studios for a very long time. So 
So there's a lot, I think there's just a lot of possibility. And for me being interested in the material and just kind of having a restless mind, mind a little bit, there's always something that I want to try that I haven't tried before. And then I want to try that. So, yeah, you know, it's fascinating. It's recently been, you know, it's primarily a factory effort. And, yeah. you know, for the, for the most part, it's been centuries in the factory and now it's escaped the factory. And I think the factory is looking for overviewing the, uh, the cottage industry that we have. I sometimes think of flame working as a cottage industry and so many creative people making things that are so attractive. And I think the factory is a, on the verge of trying to knock off, <laughs> but knock off the uh, the work. Shane, what's your take on the uh, critique on the discussion on the discussion? Uh, you mean in terms of critique? Still, are we still on critique? I don't know. Now I'm seventy-seven, so I forget easily. Yes, critique. <laughs> Uh, well, I can start off with critique. Uh, you know, I think critique is a funny thing. In my experience, I've seen a, I've seen a lot of good come out of it, but I've also seen uh, some negativity come out of it. I know that a couple of people have received critiques that almost made them leave um, glass yeah, yeah. by professors. Um, so I think when I teach and I, and I do do a critique usually at the end of each class and you know I've been teaching over 30 years I think what I probably do is I give them an assignment and then you know there is sort of a show and tell you know it's not necessarily a critique and everybody looks at everybody's work and what I do is I go through each person and talk to them about the positive things that they've done um I don't focus on the negativity and that's that's always been my approach no. i guess i've seen you know some negativity come out of it so it depends on what you mean by critique you know you have to be i think you have you're dealing with emotions right you have to be empathetic. i think you have to be considerate of the person who puts so much of their heart and soul into the uh sculpture that, uh, but know. I think if we're talking about the benefits of going to school and learning about how to speak, that's one of the reasons you go to art school. I have to tell my students how mm -hmm. we critique. I have to teach them, you know, the, the first thing I tell them is you can't say I like it, you know, like everyone just wants and, and you can't it's a critique isn't to me about making friends. It's about giving feedback. Right, um, yeah. So it, but it's a really hard lesson for an 18 year old to learn because all an 18 year old wants to say is I like it. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty yeah. it's hard and I agree Shane like I I've seen people cry without even me I've made people cry without meaning to make them cry you I mean it's it's like but on the other hand there's a sense of honesty that you really want you want they work so hard on something you want to give that back well you're assuming that they're taking a course with the with the idea that they may choose this as a career and if they're if they're thinking about glass and, and glass art as a, a career path, then they have to understand that it's a professional environment and it's serious work. So, you know, and artists are professionals. I think that uh, art school will educate you. It's about artistic maturity, and art schools will uh, educate you to uh, pursue excellence as you, um, over the course of 10, 15, 20 years, it's a lifestyle, it's a journey. And in the community as an artist, you, you gain a lot of respect, people, you meet a lot of professionals and they're interested in your career. And um, you have, I think that uh, you're respected as a professional in the community. So, uh, Anybody have any anything else to add to that? Uh, we critique covered a wide range, but uh... well, I, have a, I have a funny little story. Um, I know that uh, when Lino was having this uh, big show, they wanted him to talk about his work, which is sort of a critique of sorts. Sure. Um, and he 
he looked at each piece. He went down the line and he said, I like the color. I like the form. It was difficult to make. I like it. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, um, one of the things that I'm big on is uh, as a uh, self-directed, you know, I've been engaged in uh, self-directed learning and I've done it with audible books. I've listened to over 40 years, I've listened to uh, uh, audible books and, and it's, and my, I, I like to think that I'm pursuing, I'm inventing a, a personal language and it's about, and I'm pursuing excellence. And I define excellence. Is this part of the, uh, I think this is part of the journey. I look at uh, uh, Sarah Sally Legrand's work and she's inventing a new language, which is kind of interesting. And, uh, and even uh, we're all inventing a new language. And it's fun for me as an old timer to look at work and see something so fresh that my eyes have never seen anything like it before. And that's wonderful. Wow, look at that. <laughs> and then before, you know, it's, um, you know, the community is a very, very, um, very inclusive and very, very warm community with a lot of respect for makers. Uh, who can I ask? What, uh, Dave, I'll put you on first. What's your take on craft, design, and art? Do you, does it mean anything to you or what's your take? Probably, on? You know, I think, I think, you know, like a lot of things, it's kind of subjective to how you look at things, you know, because on one level I go, well, they're separate things. And on one level, you know, I go, they're connected things. Um, from, you know, from a glassmaker's perspective, I've always looked at, you know, one of the criteria of a good artwork in my mind has always been, it has to be constructed well, because glass, you know, if it's not constructed well, it's just gonna fall apart. But I think when you start talking about more art things and contemporary art, those kind of considerations, everything can just fall out of relevance because you know some work isn't about um, being well crafted and doesn't have to be well crafted exactly. necessarily to be accepted or, or anything like that or well designed or or anything and and it just becomes like well you know do I think this is a good design or someone else might think it's a bad design or you know and, and so those kind of questions just don't really matter in some contexts of art, I think. Yeah. So it's a hard question to answer. Yeah, it is. Odd. Amy, what's your take on the, uh, do you get into the, uh, the various categories of uh, art making with your students? Well, not, well, you know, it's interesting because um, I think there's sort of a new way of looking at this, these designations, craft design and art. And if you look at the contemporary art world, um, the role of the artist is a lot of times when you start looking at these big production shows is as like a project manager. And even in the, the graduate school, I went to Pratt Institute in Brooklyn about 10 years ago, and students were having work fabricated um, by other people. And so, you know, when you're in the contemporary art world, um, I think that the divisions, there are some clear, there can be some clear divisions between the roles of the craft person as fabricator and the roles of the artist as the um, person who's the originator of the concept of the idea. And as a designer, when you get into the marketplace, um, who designs the object and then has a fabricator make it. So yeah. I feel like in the 21st century, these, these three themes that you've identified kind of interconnect in a different way than they have in generations past. Yeah. You know, uh, Amy, what's your take on the, do you get into it with your students? Uh, excuse me, uh, Amber. Um, yeah, I think that, you know, nowadays in, in a glass program, it's really important to talk about all three of those things um, right. and how they can be interconnected. You know, I also think that, you know, as, as, educators in a programs like this, we have a responsibility to teach people 
how to try to make some money with this, you know? So um, I think that talking about design, fabricating for other people, um, these are all just avenues, um, avenues and ways of making- Support an your work, support your life. Yeah, to support your life. Well, maybe you're making your own work, artwork, you know, for one avenue, but you're also fabricating for someone else or you're assisting, you know? So I think that all those things are really important to try to touch upon nowadays, you know, not just like making conceptual artwork. When I started out, uh, South Jersey, I, I live in the Southern New Jersey with a rich glass tradition. And the crown jewel of that glass tradition was uh, the Millville Rose Paperweight. And I was fascinated with the idea that here's this flower, this rose ah. suspended in a ball of glass. No, <laughs> Amy has the Millville Rose Paperweight. Made by Don Friel. Really? Good for you. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I wanted to learn how to make paperweights and I had this skill as a scientific glass blower. And I, and I tried to, and I had working in Borosoki glass. So I had to teach myself how to work in um, sort of lime glass. I had to learn how to ball, ball, ball up an inch and a half glass sphere and get something in it. And over the course of, uh, I think it took me four or five years to get more proficient with uh, a small paperweight. And then I started to get creative. And as the more creative I, the more information I was able to, sh to, to put into the work, uh, the more excited I became. And I started thinking about, hey, craft, design, and art. And you know, for me, people can call me anything they want. They want to call me a crafts person? God bless you. you. Want to call me a designer? Okay, God bless you. you. Want to call me an artist? Fine. Doesn't matter. It's the, the work is what's important, and history will, you know, art historians will put it where it belongs. Um, who wants to jump in on that, Shane? Sure. I love well, your birds, Shane. I I, I know that uh, museums around the country are putting them. Uh, they're kind of exquisite. Well, thanks, Paul. Um, you know, I've been involved in this discussion for decades, you know, craft versus art. And, you know, I think design plays a more important part in the last 10 years in, in the discussion. But, you know, I have to say that I think that, you know, a lot of this distinction between craft and art was created by um, art criticism uh, I don't think that, you know, it was really that uh, important, you know, in our past, in the history of art. Uh, people just made things, that, you know, they were called artisans. They didn't, sure. they didn't categorize everything so separately. I think the one uh, common denominator in all of it was that it had to be made uh, well-crafted and, and uh, aspired towards excellence. And I think that's still the case. Well, I think craft is, uh, you know, um, it's about making it well. It's not necessarily about originality. Design is a certain amount of uh, originality, uh, but it's, you know, it's built for the marketplace. And art is uh, the upper echelon of the whole experience. Does, um, let's, do, uh, Kristen, do we have any questions from the, uh, the audience? Um, you know, it's kind of ironic. Uh, as soon as Amber started talking about the responsibility of talking with our students about their futures so far as um, financially making them viable, uh, being, able, being able to continue our artistic practice, uh, that was a question that came in. Um, we have people wondering about sustaining art making after school and how to make that happen. Um, we also have people uh, wanting to hear about more about lamp working, going into art and um, glass programs, sculpture and glass programs. So mm -hmm. whatever direction you might want to well, go in on either of those. You know, I think, um, and maybe the uh, panelists will build, it, build onto it, but these art schools have about 150,000 plus commitment to blowing glass and, fusing and I mean, co-working and 
and they don't want to dilute the programs now with flame working because I think there's a negative bias towards flame working in the art schools. I, th I think it's a difficult conversation. Um, and I think what Amber brought up was really true about, um, you know, I, I have a hard time telling students that I think they should be an artist and that they should be a professional glassmaker. Uh, because it's not an easy path. And I think everyone on this entire Zoom meeting knows that. Um, but it's a quality, I would say to them, you know, it's a quality of life, like you're choosing a path. And I think Paul even said that the other day. He said, before we ended a, a pre-meeting, he had said something about, it's all about finding your path. Yeah. Um, and I think that, but I think there was even a, I think Robert Mickelson had put in the chat, you know, how can art students be better prepared for making a living in the real world? I think the first way to do that is to be honest with them um, and, and say, you know, I go to a, I teach at a school that's incredibly expensive. And, and so I know that these kids are coming out with huge student loans. And that's a big responsibility for me to feel like to, to say, go for it, go for it. Because, you know, I went to a state, state school for undergrad and came out with no student loans, but these kids today are not in that same situation. Um, and you have to make sure that they are aware. And that's why I like hearing from Amy and, and talking about, look at design and, and talking about, yes, there are other ways to make a living. Um, you can stay within the arts. You're, you're always gonna be able to get a job within the arts. Will it be directly making your own art? Well, you know, maybe. You, you can work for the studios. You know, if you have skills, if you have flame working skills, you could go into a hut shop and uh, compliment, the, compliment the work with m making components and adding on to the, uh, the blown glass. I mean, I think I in would, theory, Paul, in theory, mm -hmm. that's probably true, but I don't know how many glass blowing studios are actively looking to hire flame workers to incorporate into their product line. But I agree with you, there's a lot of opportunity to cross mix oh, glass yeah. things, but I don't really know, like I don't know, <laughs> I can't think of any blown glass studios that are kind of banging down the doors looking for flame workers. Well, Jay Musler worked at a production shop that made goblets and he was very skilled at it, but he wanted to do his own work. So he set up a torch in a garage and started making his uh, his small, actually small sculptures, but then he he got involved with uh, cutting bell jaws in half and uh, sandblasting and uh, painting them, uh, airbrushing, cutting the rims to mimic the city. And they were a huge success. So, I mean, when there's a will, there's a way. I was poor as could be for six years. It almost is scary when I look back at it. <laughs> well, I think that's also, you know, apropos today too, you have to have a lot of tenacity and persistence in pursuing any kind of art, whether it's glass related or not. You have to be flexible. You have to, you know, move with changes. And, you know, like when I first started out, you, I had a production work and I had salespeople and I sent out samples and they, sold it all over the country and that slowly changed. And when the internet came, you know, it's like you have to go with the flow in a way and just stick with it and be persistent. You know, and also as makers, as object makers, I think of myself as an object maker. You're investing your time and talent into the work to and having it evolve. And as you get uh, better at it, as the work evolves and becomes more interesting, Sales uh, is it's compliment. Sales are compliment. I mean, it, sales are supporting that work. So you know, on your if you're on a journey and you're pursuing excellence, and you're trying to make things that are personal, uh, you, I think the hardest thing for an artist to do is to identify their audience. If you think about it. Well, and I think on the chat, someone had even written, you know, um, Mickelson. But he's, he was saying, you know, art major plus business major equals a better chance of success. And I know that many, many of the graphic design students throughout the years are always have always taken business classes. That hasn't always been required of most art majors, um, no. which is something that I think is important for students to, to do and investigate. Well, there's, there's, situ there's opportunities to, to produce, to, to get a... Um, to become proficient at a, uh, 
within a style to make an object and have it represent and have uh, distributors represent your work. And I don't know about eBay. Does anybody is anybody making any making a living on eBay? I don't know. Well, but, I wouldn't call it a living, but <laughs> it makes sense. They certainly sell a few things on eBay, yes. So, yeah, yeah. And through my website and yeah, I mean, you have to have a lot of different avenues. I mean, I would actually, honestly, I was in sales for 20 years. I sold radio advertising. So it helps a lot. Yeah. Kristen, uh, did we answer the, some of the questions that were asked? Or are we, are we just floating? Yeah. I guess so, around about a little bit. Um, yeah. Well, I, it's, a tough, it's a tough road so, to follow. An, another... Right. Another another point too could be um, you know assisting artists in making their work or fab or just fabricating for other artists is a great way to learn and get paid to learn and not only to improve your flame working skill but also to you know pay attention to how your clients are doing business and to learn how to communicate and um, you know you also get the opportunity to maybe make some forms that you wouldn't normally in your own artwork so there's a lot of benefits to um, working for other artists and, and you know, um, engaging with the art and design world as a fabricator too. Yeah, yeah. Also, Amy, if I could add to that, um, it's been, you know, that's been a part of work that I've done kind of continuing over the last 10 or 20 years and, and learning, you know, for me, that's been a big part of my arts education and art education and, you know, talking to people who are professional artists outside of glass has really expanded how I think about art. And that's been a huge benefit of doing that fabrication work also in my mind. Same, I'm, I'm what they like, what I like to call the last resort fabricator where a lot of my clients come to me after, you know, a whole bunch of other people have told them, no, that form is impossible. And so there's a lot of problem solving involved and, um, you know, it, it leads me somewhere that I wouldn't necessarily go in my own work, but then all of the skills I get to keep and use in my work in the future. Um, so it's like a win-win, but there's a lot of learning that happens on the job. And I think that, I mean, I, I didn't go to, to college for glass blowing. I have two degrees in painting and drawing contemporary art. Um, I'm self-taught as a flame worker and I really learned by doing fabrication. So there, there's a lot of, um, there's, there's a lot there to, um, to learn from for sure. You know, uh, in the flame working world, there's um, a large community uh, that are interested in marbles and paperweights and goblets and and uh, good good design, good craft. And I think that uh, if if you have the if you if you have the perseverance, which we all know is the major ingredient in this business, you persevere. You know the history of the of your category. You know who's doing great work out in the world, and you work to uh, bring bring a different flavor to the to the field. And lo and behold, people are anxious to buy your models <laughs> or your paperweights. And I think what you just said is bringing it back to the art school conversation and flame working with the arts within art schools is bringing a different flavor. Um, you know, like teaching, a vo teaching students to have a voice. And as Amy, Amy said, you know, teaching creative problem solving, that's what we're doing. We're teaching problem solving. And I think um, Mauro had written in the chat that, you know, like he said, my stu most of the students that I have, they just want to make what I make. Um, and I think that that is really important thing to talk about as well. Like, how do you, the assignments you give, they have to uh, set up these problems that can, especially within the classroom, that students can uh, go in their own paths. And yeah, but uh, beginners learn by uh, imitating. That's the way it is. You know? And that's so hard. And, yeah. But even to teach technique, I mean, we all know flame working is so difficult technically. And then, you know, I'm interested to hear about how the different people on this panel might teach something. Um, you know, like, are you guys starting with a marble? Like, you know, or are you? Like you no, know, if I would have, if I would have went to, if I enrolled in art school and told the art professor, the art instructor, I wanted to make a paper, he'd probably slap my hand. <laughs> <laughs> a paperweight? No. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, if you, 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 
now I'm making laws. And I think it's, uh, I love the magnification, but you know, you become, you follow your inclination, I guess. You, if you're curious about something, you go for it and you make it, uh, you know, disadvantages to being uh, self-taught and avoiding the art school, uh, but you have to be educated. You have to know the past. You have to know what, you have to know what, uh, who's doing significant work on the glass landscape. And, pa and Paul, actually, someone, someone had written, um, what would you, what do you think the instru instructor would want you to make? They wouldn't want me to make a paperweight. I don't think. <laughs> Amy, am I right on that? Uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think maybe challenge yourself a little bit more. You there know? you go. <laughs> yeah, but I'm, uh, yeah, I'll say, well, I'm, I'm having a hard time getting that little flower to get a pistol in the middle of the flower. <laughs> anyway, I, I hear what you're saying. Okay, well, let's see. Um, you know, it's not easy. It really isn't. And a lot of artists have side gigs. They're, they're, they, they have little part-time jobs. They may, they may work for others. But uh, anybody want to, uh, also another thing that I think is uh, artists are fine-tuned. I think artists experience a lot of anxiety. And I think the anxiety works for them. I think that the anxiety is, uh, in the center of anxiety is beauty. <coughs> That's not too abstract. And you're seeking, you're seeking, you want to do something that's beautiful. And you're willing to um, experience the anxiety to work past the anxiety to, to uh, get that creative bliss. There are times, I'm sure we all have had go <laughs> dance, go dancing out of the studio, feeling like you just saved the world with something that you made that was a surprise to you. So. Amber, you want to pick up on anything? Um, yeah, I would say what what I'm maybe interested in talking about a little bit is, um, you know, flame working generally does not have a huge presence in the university glass mm -hmm. programs. Um, you know, from what I've seen, you know, Tyler has four torches. I know RIT has a program and I, I'd be curious to talk to Amy about this a little bit because I know she's doing some consulting on flame working programs in um, in the academic setting. But um, I found that flame working really hasn't been prioritized at all. Um, and I think that that's almost to the detriment of the glass programs. Um, because what I've found, at least from, from my experience is that um, you know, the hot shop tends to be kind of a, a more sh extroverted experience for people. Yeah. And sometimes I find that the more introverted students, at least and me too, you know, I like to work alone, um, not have people kind of looking at me and watching me all the time. Yeah. And I find that you can kind of attract a lot of um, students through flame working. Um, if that's part of your program. I think flame um, is a solitary experience. I think it's like long distance, like track versus blowing is be like, you know, football or something, soccer, whatever. Oh, like a team sport, you mean? Yeah, a team sport versus a solitary. Well, I always think it's your gateway drug. It's your, yeah. um, it's, <laughs> if you, you know, blow, blowing glass. <laughs> you know, uh, Sculpture art programs are not the only place where you'll find flame working. You'll also find flame working uh, teaching happening in scientific glass blowing studios as well. And a lot of universities do have teaching facilities um, in their scientific labs. So, uh, it, or maybe also in jewelry studios too. I work with quite a few students who are able to also flame work in a jewelry facility. So, you know, I think maybe like opening our minds to where the studio can be positioned within the school is also um, something to think about too. Well said, yeah. Yeah, I just, I'm trying to stay out mostly um, and let you guys go, but uh, I just want to mention like 
to what Amber said, like there, there is an interest um, with students. They have an interest in flame working. Um, currently here right now, we have students who have graduated from several different uh, glass programs throughout, throughout the United States. And they're here at Salem now getting their associate's degrees uh, after their BFAs or their MFAs. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it, there is interest there. Um, it's economical too, Kristen. It's wonderful. Oh yeah, it's we're, economical. yeah, yes, yes. You know, I, you, could, you could put in a very well-equipped flame working studio for probably $5,000. Yeah, it's it's sustainable to students yeah, right. after they leave school, which I think is, is huge. You know, if we're talking about sustaining an art practice and how can you do that while you're maybe having to work as an artist assistant for somebody else or fabricating someone else's work or working in arts administration or your hot shop assistant. Like when you go back in your own studio, what can you have access to, to be working with this material? For the long term. Well, okay. if you be <laughs> schooled and have a job, whatever the job would be, you could do flame working on this part time. And I worked part time for like three years before I had enough courage to quit my job. So, uh, Shane, you want to chime in here? Well, uh, you know, I think that the thing is, is that. You know, I, I don't know. I've been to a lot of universities that have, you know, I don't know, short residencies. I said that before, you know, and they drag out a torch, you know, Kent State for one a uh, long time ago, they drag out a torch, you know, and I'll talk to the professors and, you know, the staff there. And, and they generally have an, an interest, but whether it's, you know, properly... I guess, instituted into their, their program is another thing that, you know, this isn't something new. Uh, I think, I think it's important um, that it be part of a program, you know, but it's not, it's not going to be a focus, you know, but look at Salem, they do have that, you know, that's, that's a viable place. All the institutions that teach flame working as far as workshops, well, I think Salem is uh, a center for flame working in, in the world, actually. It's, it's very, and there's some schools in Germany and other places in the United States that, that focus on uh, programs, you know, uh, in uh, Zwiesel, uh, outside of Frauenau and the Czech border. Yeah. Well, you um, know, there, there's, uh, there's a lot of other places and they teach a lot of different things. Well, I'm very impressed with Anna Sipska, what she was able to accomplish with no background in glass, no equipment. She wanted to work in glass. The professor gave her a uh, saline torch. She broke bottles and started stretching them and then connecting them. And lo and behold, she invented uh, a whole new way of uh, of uh, hot glass, working hot glass, in scale, large scale. You know, uh, I think uh, uh, David. David, you're friendly. Are you friendly with uh, Anna Sipska? Yeah, you know, I don't see her much, but I, I, I really like her. And does she show her work in the Seattle area? She has a studio in the Seattle area, and she often does like a studio tour for the Pilchuck, you know, sure. or, or stuff like that. But I haven't seen her work um, in any of the Seattle galleries for a long time. I think she used to show with Traver, but yeah. I'm not, I, I know, I think the last time I talked to her was a couple years ago. And I don't think she really is interested in working in the context of glass. And she doesn't really think of herself as a glass artist or as someone who works with glass just as a sculptor. And I think more of her work is probably international in sculpture galleries, but I'm yeah. not sure hundred percent if that's true. Yeah. Well, I have a lot of respect for her inventiveness and I am fascinated to see, uh, see other flame workers using borosilica glass, picking up on that, connecting the, 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 the pulled, connecting the pulled uh, tendrils 
together to make large scale geometric forms. Did Brent Key Young, he worked in borosilicate, right? Or did he? Yeah, use he did. Yeah. Uh, now Brent Key Young in the 70s and 80s would make uh, uh, framework skeletons, fish skeletons and, and uh, uh, what's when you have a, a fossils, he would do fossils and then he would blow glass, put a dark background on inside the glass and roll up the uh, fossils onto the glass and blow it in. Very, very successful. So, you know, there's, there's not, a, you know, there's only a few creative people for, I don't know, if you have creative people inventing new ways to express, express themselves, it could open up the field. But uh, I think we have to, I don't, my story is Wheat Knots, Hank, Hank Murder Adams was a glass manager, managed the glass center at Wheaton. He said, Paul, I want you to make a 50 pound block with a thousand bees in it. I said, boy, he says, come on, you can do it. Come on, you can do it. I said, well, I guess I can. You gonna help me? Yeah, I'll help you. So I made this 50 pound block of glass with bees and I had golden orbs. And it was heroic, it was Herculean. And at the end of the whole thing, I said, no, no, I'm, not, <laughs> I'm happy with my scale. I'm glad I did it because I wasn't interested in doing large scale work. Plus it cracked. <laughs> anyway, Dang so <laughs> where are we going with this team? Well. On that note, Paul, I just want to say in the art schools, especially in the art schools that do not have glass as a, a sculptural material to work with, yeah. there's a lot of interest in borosilicate. And, um, you know, there's a lot of interest in, explore, in exploring borosilicate for sculpture because it can be reworked, revised, and repaired in ways that soda lime glass cannot. So I think there's a lot of applications that are yet to be uh, explored with that. And art schools are sort of like, a great um, environment to introduce this material into kind of an incubator and let the students run with it. Yeah, absolutely. For these ideas. Yeah. Yeah. Where does well, beauty fit into this? Uh, you know, let's get philosophical. Before Where we get philosophical, mm -hmm. can I just like add something for the yeah, and flame workers that are on the on the call? Because um, we did talk about this a little bit, you know, a couple of days ago when we were warming up. But I think in the context of the sculptural stuff, like um, we're talking about building out of borosilicate rod and mm -hmm. because it's so approachable and kind of easy to repair and stuff like that. The first pieces that I did, um, I did out of bullseye rod because it's about a quarter the price and they have a really broad palette of colors and it's really beautiful. Um, and I didn't really notice, you know, at that scale working a, you know, four or five, six millimeter rod that there was any problem working with the softer glass um, versus the borosilicate. And the borosilicate is just so much more expensive. And when I was doing that, it was probably 20 years ago, the color palette in borosilicate was so much smaller than it is today that it really made sense for me to work cheaper and work with more colors. Were so you I, I don't, I don't your think work? that you, huh? Were you annealing your work, David? Sure. <laughs> I, you know, I, I never really anneal it as I go. Like I remember um, talking to Kari Russell Poole when I saw her demo at Corning like 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. And I think she was saying she anneals her work every day um, after she works with it, yeah. at least at that time. I don't really do that. If I'm working on something large scale, I'll generally anneal it as it starts to really object to what I'm doing to it. Yeah, yeah. Work, 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 work. And as long as it's not cracking all the time, I just keep going. Once yeah. I'm spending as much time repairing cracks as building, then I anneal and then kind yeah. of keep moving forward. Yeah. But I just wanted to throw that bit in about um, flame working other kinds of glass and finding it approachable and cheaper. What's your, what's your take on beauty? I love it. It's beautiful. I love beauty. That's what's your take on it? How do you how do you layer beauty into your work? I think that uh, um, you know because I work to a large degree from nature, 
I think beauty kind of starts at the concept, you know, because, you know, I, I think just, you know, natural objects and forms and everything are beautiful. I'm sure yeah. you kind of agree there. But I remember once talking to Jim Hodges, who's an artist that I have worked with a lot and asking him, you know, this question. And he gave me an answer that was really satisfying at the time. And then, you know, I said, you know, what do you think about like beauty and, and how do you know when you're working on something for so long, if you're gonna like it when you're done with it? Cause sometimes you committed to building something it's taking forever. You go through these peaks and valleys of, I love it, I, I love it, I hate it, I love it, I hate it, it's okay kind of thing. And he said, well, I feel like if I start with beautiful materials, that's that that really gives me a good jumping off point. And I think because glass is kind of inherently a beautiful material that really helps um, the work be beautiful. That's a nice comment. Uh, Sarah Sally, what's your take on beauty? Well, I think, you know, artists pursue beautiful things, you know, partly because of the transitory nature of, you know, like flowers die and sunsets set and, you know, people pass. And so I think it's part of trying to preserve the beauty of that moment because yeah. it's fleeting. Well, Amber has a beautiful box with objects in it, the asymmetrical objects, and it's beautiful to me. So beauty doesn't have to be uh, red. <laughs> doesn't have to be red. But beauty doesn't have to be red. <laughs> red color or, you know, beauty comes in all flavors. And I think sometimes uh, work that's aggressive can really be satisfying in a, in a beautiful way. So who wants to take on, who wants to add? Uh, Paul, a couple, a couple people. Um, have reiterated the same question. Uh, Elliot Todd chimed in. If you guys don't know Elliot's work, look it up. He does an amazing job. Um, he, he says, anyone have tips for a pipe maker trying to market some sculpture? I've been trying to make donations of art to a museum, but only sales, the only sales he's doing are sneaking a sculpture into a pipe show. This could translate to, to making anything, doing any type of production item, but then you're now trying to make, you know, um, more creative individual work. How do you put yourself out there to begin with? Well, you have opportunities that are just recent within my lifetime. Uh, you have Facebook and Instagram. Um, you have um, social media. I would say focus on making your sculpture, making your one of a kind efforts, have them professionally photographed and put it out there. And Learn from it, live with it. You know, you don't have to sell everything you make. I actually think this, this is a really interesting conversation because the, um, I don't know if you know Elliot's work, Paul, but he's already pretty much a famous Instagram um, sensation. Wow. His work is really inventive and amazing. And I think what it's interesting to come from your point of view, who is someone who was um, supported and engaged and um, by the gallery, by a gallery, you know, you yeah. were picked up by this gallery. And I think that um, now the tables, I think what Elliot's saying is he has that social networking following and he's looking for that kind of support that you found. And I wonder if that support is, um, I think there's a lot of transitions happening in the world right now. And I wonder if that support is in transition right now. Well, I think the gallery is like, I think there's a, we're at a we're at a difficult time period because it's business is slow, but the galleries are interested, looking very diligent. They're looking for good work, and I think the Habitat Gallery, I, uh, Habitat, I know this. They're offering the work of five or six flame workers, I'm and so Elliot. Should, uh, oh, hey. Hi, Paul. Good to see Sharon, you. Karen Shea is a partner in the Habitat Gallery. Share with us your uh, your take on uh, finding work to represent in the flame working community. Yeah, big big supporters in the flame working community. You know, um, it's a lot different than you think of it from a gallery aspect of it. People, and many of you know this already, have a lot of experience under your belt 
and I and there's people out there that I know about that I, I love to talk to. And it's about a phone call. You know, show me what you're working on. I love to see uh, what you're working on. I want to talk about your ideas. I had a long conversation with Lee Wingfield about a year or two ago about the artists themselves, all, everybody on this call, it has an, an unbelievable, you're, you're an asset to the art community, an asset to me that I, can, that I don't want to take advantage of, but I want to work with. So tell me your idea. Show me what you're working on. If you don't have an art degree, then so what? Let's talk about what your ideas are. Early in the conversation, we talked about uh, what's right and what's wrong, what you should be doing, what you shouldn't be doing. As long as you're confident in what you're doing, then I want to talk to you about it. If you, if you believe in it, I want to talk to you about it. If you, if you have um, fear or you want to work out an idea, I'm happy to do it with you. I could, from a sales perspective, and we talked about a business side of, artist this is a very important thing because I, I can going through this in my career i can tell you how many artists i told just to make a business card they had no concept of what what to do to organize themselves as an artist but you guys a lot of the artists already passed that point especially with today's social media so there is no like right like we have a great uh, six-week show going right now with kathleen elliott all virtual all on artsy we put out promotion every week for it if she's selling a bunch of her uh, work out of her studio it's her idea. We came up with an idea how to execute it, and we're marketing it to my clientele. I I have a certain way I, I can offer stuff to my clientele. I can't sell them everything, um, and I can tell you if we're on we're on we're in reality or not. But if there is no right or wrong here, just approach the gallery with your idea. If we don't have time at that particular time, we'll do it later. But we'll talk about sure. whatever's going on, and that's that's how I perceive it. Is it how Ferd did it? Like, did Corey? Maybe not. I know Corey did it a lot like that. Just talk to people. But if you have an idea, let's talk more about it. So the idea is simply, if you have an idea to, to talk about a gallery with, make a phone call and, and talk to us. We're, we're, we're open. We're, we're ready to have a discussion. Could they send you uh, slides first or maybe yeah. follow yeah. up a slide to follow up with a conversation on the phone? Absolutely. Just send over images of what, what your what your idea is and images and we'll, we'll talk about it. There really isn't uh, a specific pattern that you have to jump through to, to reach a gallery. It's just, yeah. just talk about your idea. Hey, yeah. Aaron, I don't want to put my foot in my mouth here, but I always do. So I'm just going to do it anyway. Um, do you think that there is like this um, right now, a lag time between the galleries and the people who follow other people on Instagram? Like, do you think Elliot has this very young group of followers on Instagram who are maybe don't have the capital yet to go buy from a gallery? And do you think that that might change within the coming years and, and then things will catch up and, and reorganize themselves? I know it's a funky question, but I'm curious about that difference between the people who follow people and then the people who purchase artwork or you know be, it's interesting right you're 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 itching on a, something i'm working on every day so I, I have a show that i'm doing which is 12 months long called not grandma's glass and it's focused on 12 artists working in a style that's not conformed to what we've done in the past artists the clients the younger clients aren't buying the way the older clients used to buy so this particular mark that you said it was elliot the clientele he has is a market that we want to try to reach. Now we don't deal in functional artwork in general. You know, we have we show a couple of Robert Nicholson's pieces, but other than that, we haven't really, really done it and uh, and promoted it in that way. And because of that, we might be mixed missing a mark of younger collectors who are into that or older collectors have it too. But the talent that that community has is unbelievable. The energy that community has is unbelievable. So. I find uh, it's a, it's something that we have to take advantage of because that's a market. You can't blanket everybody and advertise artwork to everybody because that doesn't work like that anymore. It isn't the days when you just make a product and everybody buys your raffle maker. It doesn't work like that. So you, if you have an artist that has a fan base, you can work with that artist to expand the fan base. And it's difficult to find. We're all trying to find new younger collectors. We're all trying to do that, you know, and and since younger people are uh, interested in buying in an artwork in a different way, then us galleries have to adapt to that or else we're not going to survive. I had a conversation mm -hmm. with Jim recently. I wanted to do 25th year of the international. But I wanted to do early Japanese edition. 
So our 50th edition this year, let's 50th year, let's do another edition. Well, they shot down that idea. Because it's not how the studio works. They have a specific studio time and it goes and, and they couldn't squeeze it. It doesn't work like that. I said, okay. But it goes to show like, if you don't, like, as you were saying, you don't adapt to the next thing or be flexible, you're not going to be around. So that's, I'm being, I'm trying to be as flexible as can and open up to any kind of ideas out there because without it, um, if you stay stagnant, if I run the, the gallery the same way Ferg did it uh, in, the, in the 80s and 90s, my predecessor, we wouldn't be around today. So the answer is yes. I, you know, I, it's, it's a great way of paying attention to artists that I'm not aware of and communities that I'm not aware of. Because every community is an interesting way of exposing, not only expanding that community for that artist, but to beyond other artists. And hopefully, you know, to more artists you represent. You know, a lot of the artists don't think uh, wholesale retail, or they don't think uh, uh, how the galleries mark up work. And they generally double the work. They generally I double think the work. That, that's, um, that can be uh, discouraging for some of the artists. They feel that they should be getting um, more money for their work. Yeah, I, 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 you know, I, I think all of us should be making more money for your work. Watch, listen, you guys. Absolutely, but you and know, the time and effort you guys put into your work, it's unbelievable. We have, we have a budget. We have to promote. We have to market, and we work together to do that. It's worth. Excuse me, it. Aaron. Yeah. Do you excuse me? Do you pay attention to work being made in any of these glass programs at the at the university level? So I get I I, I pay attention when I can. I get a lot of recommendations from my artists we know or friendships we have or clients we have. Mm -hmm. I get, uh, you know, books and uh, when they do auctions and whatnot and pay attention to people, write names down to contact, but I'm always up for, for learning about younger artists up and coming. There's a certain aesthetic I look for, uh, a certain level that I want to, you know, be able to market to my clients. And it, it, it kind of kind of comes at me. And a lot of it is, 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 is really recommendations. Most schools have um, have Instagram accounts where they showcase student work. And so I would recommend maybe uh, checking up some of those and seeing what's going on in the colleges because these are all the up and coming artists who yeah. you'll meet eventually. And you could really put your finger on the pulse by paying attention to what's happening in these schools. You're, you're and that goes for everybody. Right? Yeah. You know, one of the roles the gallery plays is to promote the artists. I think that my career has been complemented with the, by being associated with galleries and having them promote my work to the to the glass world. Right. I don't, I I don't think I'm going to do that with uh, myself. I, I, like we also protect the artists, you know, like I have a big collection of Paul's work in my studio that's from the secondary market. And if I didn't get this collection, it would have flooded the market for Paul. And I'm able to control it to make sure that it doesn't flood the market for Paul. And I do this for a lot of the artists when I get artwork and I, I'm controlling of the secondary market work to, to keep it, keep everybody happy. Make sure it's selling up to the clients happy and, and sell Paul's work at the same time mm -hmm. because it's, it's different different types of work. Um, How important yeah. is the secondary market to a Habitat gallery? It's, it's, it's a very important part of the business. Without the secondary market, you don't really show, there's a hard way to prove value uh, in artwork because people are paying for it. Another thing that we have as galleries is our partnership and our trust with our clients. They, you know, I've, I haven't had a guy who calls me up every, every month and he talks about work and I direct him what he, what he should be, what he should be in his collection. Tori, my, my partner, Colin Hanson, is notorious for working with clients, developing their collection. Um, and I, these clients have a trust in me. I'm driving to Vienna, Ohio in a couple of weeks now to go visit a client who I've been to his house three times in the last three months to deliver artwork myself personally. And I, 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 many of you know, I may not know, I have a brand new baby due in April this month or this year, and I'm still working as hard as I can for all of the artists that I have in my habitat family. And with, without them, you know, our business doesn't exist. So it, it, we don't treat it like anything but a partnership between our artists that are in our family and the gallery. And it's, it's a trust, and I don't want to ever lose that trust. Ferdinand gave me and Corey that trust, and I make sure to take care of it every single day. That's beautiful. Aaron, thank you very much for sharing the gallery perspective on our art school goals, on our uh, flame working glass goals to art school. You're, you're, a, 
You're fantastic. Sell some of my work, will you please? Got it, <laughs> okay. Yeah, uh, Kristen, do we have any more questions? Um, you know, at this point, is there anybody here on the call um, that has anything left they'd like to ask the panel? Any specific panelists, any specific questions? You can go ahead and put it in the chat box if you do. In the meantime, may I bring it back to art school? And yes. Okay, so um, I, I do think that there's something that we haven't really covered, which is the future of where um, glass programs and, and um, flame working in art schools might be going. And I think that, you know, because of we're in the COVID era now, and now um, there, we've sort of uh, unleashed a whole bunch of new technologies that we're actively learning how to use. Things like um, Zoom events like this one, and um, new platforms like the Glass Educators Exchange and programming through the Glass Art Society all help link, link schools virtually and give support to uh, professors who are trying to teach flame working and also to students in glass programs or in any program who might have an interest in, uh, in flame working and wanna learn on their own and need a little support. So I think that um, that's only going to increase moving forward. Amy, how, how is that happening right now? Can you be, can you tell us how that, like, how are you making those connections or how, like I teach a flame working program. How do, uh, how do I, uh, my students become involved with what, what's happening there? Well, I, uh, a couple things. One is, um, I know I'm teaching down at Salem Community College and we are, are you aware of the, the Glass Educators Exchange? Um, oh, it's geeks.glass, G-E-E-X.glass. -E -E uh, -E -E and it's a new, it's a new platform um, that uh, uh, I'm working on a project with, um, with the Geeks platform right now, which is tailored specifically to flame workers. Um, and so more about that uh, later this semester as we start to deploy programming. But um, there is programming in the works to start to link schools together and share, say, uh, right now what we've got going on is sharing um, visiting artists lectures. And so that's something that we participate um, in at Salem where um, you know there could be a visiting artist lecture at say University of Wisconsin-Madison, but our students in New Jersey are able to um, hear the content and, um, and chime in and ask questions and um, without having to necessarily bring that artist to our school um, physically. So, you know, that's one way that technology is really helping, um, helping kind of like uh, bridge the gap, I think. Yeah, and if, if people haven't checked out Geeks yet, check it out because you can be an institutional member, um, mm -hmm. you could be an individual member, but it's a way to share resources. Like some of the people we've have, it, have had in are just like such heavy hitters and basically all these schools are all um, putting their resources together to be able to, to bring all these opportunities to all of our students. It's, it's a pretty smart thing and it's an incredible gesture. Helen Lee um, is really spearheading this. It was her kind of brainchild and, and it's incredible. It's a great idea. Dave, where do you think flame working is going into the future? Where do I think it's going? Yeah. I don't know. Um, you know, I think, uh, it's futures wide open and, you know, I, I, I think, uh, you know, something that I wanted to have before or was thinking about before and, you know, and you kind of touched on it. Um, I think it's pretty easy from a cost perspective for university programs to add flame working setups to their, you know, existing facilities. Um, I don't know. I don't know if that'll happen or not, you know, because that it's been easy for a long time. Um, but yeah, you know, so, so I don't really know. I think, you know, like most things about the future, I kind of take a, we're just going to have to see what happens. Yeah. You know, uh, Amber Cohen, I think her work predicts the future. She's doing large uh, scale <laughs> installations. And uh, I was at the Helly Gallery. Amber, I was so impressed you had floating satellites around and you had your primary focus. And I thought that was wonderful. How are you connecting your glass to the, uh, to the backboard? Are you, you don't have to answer that, Amber. You don't have to tell me the secret. <laughs> but is there a little, I mean, are you working just pure magic? 
pockets tonight. <laughs> you working larger and larger? I mean, do you have a do you have a comfort level for your for the skin? Well, they get they get a little heavy when they get really big, oh. so. Yeah. <laughs> it's more about me being able to move things around myself and yeah. you know, I, I like making big sculpture but I also like working in my studio and not having to call someone to come help me move stuff so you know yeah, yeah. well they're fascinating it's a, it's a wonderful concept and very very I love the idea you're using uh, recycled glass that's fascinating. And then you're able to catch some of the some of the imagery on some of this color mm -hmm. and make sense out of it. It's kind of great. How about I give you a bunch of my broken paperweights? And I'm, I would love that. Okay. <laughs> uh, Sal, Sarah, Sal, Sarah Sally, you're up. Yeah. Oh, no, I just say I'll take your broken paperweights. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think that, uh, you know, we're going to wrap this up pretty soon. Uh, it's been a fascinating uh, discussion. Covered a lot of territory. And uh, Shane, uh, I want to get down and see Shane. And Shane, when I saw Shane work about 15 years ago, he had crossfires. And I remember in the factory, some of the old timers had crossfires and they would melt the glass in the center of the crossfires. And I was so I was so surprised and impressed that such a young guy was working on this archaic antique torches. <laughs> so there you go, Shane. That was my impression. I just wanted to um, just say before we before we signed off that I wanted to thank um, Paul and Kristen, but I also wanted to say that Paul, you um, you know this has been about education and flame working um, and bringing it to colleges, and you might be the person in the U.S. who has done the most for flame working in colleges, and probably. Um, I know that you have been a champion of mine and have encouraged me at my lowest times, and I want to say that. Um, you know, you, I, you know, you're the reason we're all here tonight in, in on, well, on the zoom, but for a lot of us, you're also the reason why we're doing what we're doing. Um, and I thank you for that, for mm -hmm. being an educator and for caring so much about the education of uh, flame workers. Thank, thank you. you very much. Part of the community has been fascinating. Can I say something, Paul? Please do. Well, I remember uh, getting a copy of Glass Art. I think it was in 1988. Um, and I was outside my little studio in Florida at the time. And there was a picture of uh, Ginny Ruffner's, one of her sculptures on the front. And the article was about flame workers, you know, and you were featured and Ginny and Susan Plum and... Um, I don't know who else, there was somebody else. Oh, Patrick uh, that passed on. That yeah, did. yeah, yeah. Anyways, you know, the subtitle when you opened up the magazine was flame working or lamp working isn't for county fairs anymore. Yeah, I, <laughs> so yeah. really, you know, that was, you know, 33 years ago or so. Yeah. And you know what? That really influenced me uh, thinking about that. Well, yeah. when I was when I went to Salem Community College for my scientific glass program, the first thing the instructor made was a swan, and I thought, "Oh my God, look at how beautiful that swan is!" <laughs> and that and that there was something inside of me that realized that I connected with the, the creative side in glass. But you know, I want to mention Ginny Ruffner. What an inspiration she's been. She's been uh, uh, <clears throat> really her work has introduced thousands of people to um, to Borsoki glass, and she uh, she's really been a, a wonderful promoter of the process and lecturing and exhibiting, and then uh, she made she switched gears for a while and did this 
multi-ton sculpture in the downtown Seattle that has a, it's mechanized to have a water pot dropping uh, sprinkling water on a blossom. And uh, I think it was a uh, major, it's become a, it's become quite a uh, source of pride for the city of Seattle. So, I mean, we have, we're a community of wonderfully talented people. Okay, anybody wanna? Okay, that's been good. Kristen, where's Kristen? I'm right here, Paul. Congratulations, young lady. Oh, thanks, Paul. Hey, you know, I just wanted to make mention, I know you don't believe in luck, but I have to tell you that, oh, that was my life has you. been incredibly, I've been incredibly fortunate because I learned about your work. I had a job back in the early 2000s that got shut down by the federal government. Ooh. And just, just before we got shut down, one of my peers showed me your work. And I lost that job. And then I looked you up and I found Salem Community College. And you inspired me to pack up my truck and drive from Northern California to Southern New Jersey. And it's one of the best decisions that I ever made in my life. And it was one of the luckiest things that ever happened to me that somebody just showed me your work. Wow. So I know you don't, do, I know you don't believe in luck, but I do. And well, I believe in opportunity. I'm so lucky. Just I believe that, in there. You, know, you're so, you know, you're, there's so many opportunities out there and you have to, if you pick the wrong one, so what? You just let it go, let it go. And pick <laughs> <it>. <laughs> okay. Well, Thank you very much. It's been an honor for me to lead this group. And uh, our common, I'm, thank you for your kind words. I'm writing, actually, I should write. I'm writing an article on common uh, Loza for the Glass Quarterly Magazine. And Yay! It's yeah. going to be exciting. I'm really, uh, I'm going to quit paperweight making and I'm going to make the figures. <laughs> uh, common, the figures are. Thank you. You're not going to start asking her how she makes them, right? I don't know how. <laughs> I saw, saw Lucio Babaco made very delicate fingers and hands, but Carmen's fingers are so, so delicate and so wonderful. Plus the, the, the faces. I think, uh, you know, there's so much talent on the glass landscape taking advantage of flame working that we're, you know, we're, I think we're the, collectively flame working has surpassed the past. We're really taken, we brought a fine art expectation to this process. Whether we, whether the art historians are going to identify it as fine art, that's not the issue. But uh, flame working went to art schools. And that, that, that exposure to uh, art making led people, leads people to bring a fine art expectation to it. Okay. <laughs> On that note, thank you very much. Thank you all for joining uh, us. We'll make the recording available um, within the next few days. So thank you all. It's nice to see so many faces. Is it going to be on? Uh, is it going to be on uh, uh, YouTube? Yeah. yeah, we'll put it up on our YouTube. We'll send out an email to everybody who registered for the event and let everyone know on social media. So did you tell the panelists the honorarium? Oh yeah, I did. Oh. You're all invited to join You're us the next time we have our flame working conference, which is happening in March, uh, March 18th to 20th, 2022. So everyone mark your calendars. And if you miss that one, you can, it's good for, it's good for it's good uh, forever. It's good forever. <laughs> We'd love to see you here. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks so much. <laughs> Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay, Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Kristen. <laughs>